Are you struggling at work? Is work a fun place to be during the week? Are you having struggles there? It's a battle for you? Well, you're not alone. You know, a lot of folks really struggle at their workplace. You know, even in the church world, it can be tough. And we have our challenges because we're human. And no human is perfect. And when we're working with humans, then we fail each other. And, and we really struggle knowing how to respond in a, an appropriate way to the problems that we're facing at work. You know, for some, it may not just be the personal relationship that you're dealing with, but really the vision for your life. Who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? Uh, what, what am I created to do with my life? What does God want of my life? And so you're trying to figure that out, and, and sometimes it's through work experiences that challenge us of understanding really what it is that God wants for our lives. And today, we're going to learn from 1 Peter how we're able to handle our work and how to have hope at work. If you will, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, if you remember, uh, my father-in-law a couple of weeks ago uh, was, was preaching on this text and really alluded to the text uh, there toward the end about submitting to the government and how we yield to the government. And we're going to see how that intertwines with this passage today because in that section, Peter begins to help us understand how to apply hope in very practical experiences of life. The first chapter, he says there is hope. That hope is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and how to live with that hope, as we learned last week. And now he's beginning this section about how we apply that idea of hope in places where we live. All right, so let's look at verses 18 through 25 this morning. And he's talking about the workplace. Household slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. For it brings favor if, because of conscience toward God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if you endure when you sin and are beaten? But when you do good and suffer, if you endure, it brings favor with God. For you were called to this. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He did not commit sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. When reviled, he did not revile in return. When threatened, he did not threaten. But committed himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounding you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Great passage of Scripture. I've said before, this was the text that was preached when, when I was a young boy in Euless, Texas. It was seminary day on this particular Sunday. That meant that churches across the United States allowed seminary students to preach. Gary Taylor was preaching that Sunday night, actually, and he preached from this text, and I remember that I wanted to follow the steps of Christ. And I walked down that aisle, and that night my dad and I sat on the bed, and we talked, and led me to faith in Christ. Changed my life forever. Pray I never get over it, what happened that day. But it was this very text that I remember that God spoke to my heart about following Christ. It was just that, that, that strong pull, that urge. It wasn't that I was going to die and go to hell. Uh, it wasn't that I was this horrible sinner. There was just something that was compelling me to follow the example of Jesus Christ, to follow in his steps. And then I began to understand more fully what it meant to do that. So this is a very special text to me personally. And, and I'm really excited about sharing what the context of this passage is. In fact, you, you, if you remember several years ago, the bracelets came out, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do?, that whole, that whole idea came from a classic that was written many, many years ago in England on this very passage of Scripture, and it's called In His Steps by a man named Sheldon. And, and the whole book is about what would Jesus do in a particular circumstance. And every, it's, it's something we need to ask everywhere we are. What would Jesus do in this situation? What would Jesus do with this person? What would Jesus do at our church? What would Jesus do? And so we're to follow in his steps as we learn about the life of Jesus Christ. Now, Disney had a film many years ago that came out called Peter Pan. 
It's one of our family's favorite. All the Disney movies basically are. And, and I forgot about a lot of these movies until we had our first child. And then you start watching all the movies again, right? And so you learn the songs. And Peter Pan, one of the songs is called Following the Leader. Following the leader, the leader, the leader. Following the leader wherever we, he may go. Te dee te dum and all that. I won't, I won't get into all that because basically that's all the song is. Te dee te dum and all that. So, but the point is about following the leader. But I have found that for many people, following the leader is nothing more than a fairy tale song. They don't understand the concept of following the leader. And this is the point that Peter is making in this passage because it's biblical. The idea of following the leader is more than just a fairy tale song. It is biblical and it's our approach to everything that we're doing in the workplace. And how do we do that? What does that mean? And, and, and Peter helps us understand that. So how do I have hope at work? Two points I want to make this morning. Number one, follow the leadership of your supervisor. If you're going to have success at work, if you're going to have hope at work, maybe you're in a miserable situation right now. You are miserable, and it may be because of who your boss is and, what, and how to relate to your boss. Here he says, if you want to have hope, it begins by following the leadership of your supervisor. Now notice you have to, in that, understand your position to man and understand your position to God to get this idea of why I'm supposed to follow the leadership of that person who is over me. In verse 18, he talks about the relationship of the slave to the master. The slave to the master. And he's talking about household slaves. But really, the idea can be applied specifically about that relationship, but it can be applied to the employee and the employer. Because that's what the slave relationship is. Uh, the wages may be unfair, may be different, but this is what the slave, slave master idea is about is about us at work and this is where we learn from this text of how to have hope at work when they have the idea of this idea of slaves slaves we need to talk about that for just a moment in the context of the new testament period because it's really different from the idea of slavery that we experienced in america and and and, and all the things that have resulted from that there's some similarities obviously but there are some differences here in this time period, slaves, you became a slave different ways. You might have been traded into slavery. You might have been captured in war. You might have been kidnapped. You might have been born into it. Or you sold yourself into slavery because uh, you, needed, you needed help. You needed food. You needed a place to live. Uh, or in order to help your family, you sold yourself into slavery, and then that money went to your family. Or a parent would sell their child into slavery and receive that money so that they could survive as a family. So there are different reasons why they, the person became a slave. It was not based on race. In America, ultimately, it became based on race. But in the New Testament period, it was not, slavery was not based on race. It was based on, we conquered your land, you're now a slave. Or people from different parts of the world came into slavery. Many and most of, of those lived in miserable conditions. But in the New Testament period, there were slaves who were doctors, who were teachers, who were managers of wealth, managers of property. Many of them were much more educated than the actual owners of the slaves. And so slaves were extremely valuable, and they were valuable for the economy in this time period. Uh, and so it wasn't just that they were a person owned and they were beaten and they had horrible conditions. A lot of them, most of them lived in those circumstances. But we need to understand the full context of what slavery was about. You could purchase your, your freedom. Uh, that was possible, but most had no hope. Absolutely. They were in miserable situations. Now, this begs the question. It's a good question. Why did the New Testament writers not speak against slavery? Why did they not condemn slavery? Well, if you find that they didn't speak against it, they didn't speak for it. And there are several reasons why uh, that, that's possibly true. Number one, because of the, the, the massive um, uh, aspects of slavery in this time period. It, it wasn't something that was going to change overnight. It ultimately did change, and there's a good reason why it changed. But, but the, the, the gospel writers, that was not their focus. Their primary focus was on a person's relationship with God. More importantly, 
Almost all the New Testament writers, 1 Peter is a great example. The focus of the Scripture is man's response to God. Man's response to circumstances is life. Man's response to slavery. Man's response in unjust relationships, etc., etc. That's the primary focus of the New Testament writers to us. They're telling us about God and about Jesus Christ and the gospel message. Now, let me parenthetically say that's the number one reason why the New Testament was given to us is to tell the story of Christ. But what does that lead us to? Man's response to the message of Christ. Man's response to God. And then man's response as we live as Christians. And that's where the writers of the New Testament help us how to live out our faith. So that's where the primary focus has to be. You need to remember, too, that slavery ended primarily because of Christian influence. They knew that over time, as the gospel began to go out, that if enough people became believers in Christ, they would understand who their creator was and that all men are created by their creator. And all men then ought to experience freedom. And it's because of the Christian influence, if you go back in history and look about what happened particularly in England, uh, how, how great Christian men influenced the end of slavery. Still had problems, all the rest, uh, but ultimately it ended. Remember, too, that slavery was an institution that was established by man, not God. That was something that, that man had created. God did not do that. Now, in the context, he says that slaves are to submit to their masters. The application is that the employee submits to his employer, as he's talking about. Now, that's the position that we have to, to man, to, to our supervisor, is that I am to submit to that one who is over me. Now, the word submit... I've used this before in Paul's writing. The word submit is used often in the New Testament. It's a compound word. In the Greek, it's hupotasso. Hupo is under. Tasso means to rank or file. So it means to file under, to rank yourself underneath someone. It was a military word where the private hupotasso, the general, he aligned himself underneath the rank and file of the general. And what, what God was showing is that there is a formation for battle that assures victory. You can't have all generals fighting the battle. You can't have all privates fighting the battle. You have someone who is leading and someone who is following. And so we find in the workplace that there is someone who's leading and someone who's following. And the way to have success, the way to have hope in your business and where you work is that you have a role. You have a relationship. It's about your role. It's not about necessarily your right. Because all, everybody has rights that are equal, but we have different roles. And so in your workplace, there are those who are in a position to lead, whether you like that or not. And there are those who have a relationship to follow. And your position may be to lead. And if you're a, a, a master, if you're a leader, if you're the supervisor, then the picture of the New Testament is a servant leader, a loving leader. He's not the dictator in the business. So there are those of you in, in this place who have those underneath you. And so being somebody submitting to you doesn't mean that you have a dictator role over them. But you're leading them in a loving way to su succeed in the business that you're in. But ultimately in the spiritual influence that you have. And so we find that our role in that relationship, as I am ultimately responsible to you, I submit to the authority of the deacon council here. I submit to the authority of the church. That's, that's who ultimately has authority over me. And so I, I'm under authority. <clears throat> you, and all of us are under authority with somebody. Now, if you back up in the earlier verses, that we submit to our, those who are in a position, uh, those who have authority over us, the government, those who, 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 the police, whoever, we are to submit to them. That's the relationship, that the role that we have. <clears throat> now, in that, we have to ask the question, and notice, they were to submit even if their masters were, quote, cruel. Well, I've got a mean boss. I've got somebody I don't like. This guy is cruel. Well, the, the command of God is that I am to submit to that person. I'm to follow their leadership. Even if I don't think what they're doing is right for me. They're not treating me fairly, that I'm still to submit to them. Now, when is it appropriate not to submit? When is it appropriate not to submit to that person? When they're asking you to do something that is evil, that is immoral, 
that is uh, directly uh, against God's will, then, then the Bible allows us to say, no, no, that, that violates my conscience, that violates who I am as a person, therefore I'm not going to submit. And, and you have to make the call. It could cost you your job, but, but Peter speaks of that. God helps us understand the value of doing that, which is the next point. So the general principle is that I am to submit to my employer. If I want to find hope, because look, you're not going to experience any success. It's going to get worse if that's your attitude and your approach at the workplace. Now we'll see from the example of Christ what we're not supposed to do when things aren't going my way in the workplace. All right, so first of all, I'm to understand my position with man. And secondly, in following my supervisor, I understand my position with God. Peter explains why we submit. First of all, my submission is out of respect for God. Verse 18, he says, all respect or all favor toward God. And secondly, in verse 19, he says, because of conscience toward God. Why am I submitting to that person in authority over me? Because of my relationship to God. And it's not just the act of submitting, it is my attitude in submitting. And this is where the real force of the text is. It's not just the act of submitting, it's my attitude towards submitting. So I'm submitting to that person in authority over me because it will bring favor, uh, or, or uh, excuse me, it's out of respect for God that I do that. Uh, God's reputation is at stake with my attitude. That person knows you're a believer in Christ. But you're giving your employer a hard time. You're saying things about him behind his back. You're trying to usurp his authority over you. You're, you're trying to change the rules of the game. And so he knows you're a Christian and he thinks much less of you. And listen, he thinks much less of God because of that. How many people have said, I'll never go to church. I'll never be a Christian because that person says they're Christian and they act nothing like God. So it's not about you at the workplace. It's about God, it's about His reputation is at stake. It's about your Christian witness. It's about the opportunity to open a door later to share Christ with them. Because if they know you're a Christian, listen, and you're doing it the right way, you're submitting to that person even when they're not fair to you, when something in a crisis situation happens in their life, who's the first person they're gonna call? They're gonna come to you. Because they know that you're a believer. They know you're a praying person. They know that you're going to give them wise counsel. You know that they know that you're level-headed. They know that you have a moral compass in your heart and in your life that you're following. So it's out of respect for God and His witness and His name that, that I am submitting to that person that is over me. I wish I had a lot of time for that. I, I don't. So when I submit to man, I'm submitting to God. I'm submitting to God. All right, so I'm also submitting because my submission brings favor to God. Verse 19, notice what he says. For it brings favor if because of conscience toward God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. Now here's the point. Verse 20 is explaining verse 19. For what credit is there if you endure when you sin and are beaten? You did something wrong, you face the consequences of that. You know, there's no joy in that suffering. There's no favor in that kind of suffering. I, I should, I, this is what I should expect. If I did the wrong thing and I, I face negative consequences from that, that's just part of the price that I pay. But when you, when you do good and suffer, if you endure, it brings favor with God. The word favor there in verse 19 and 20 is the word charis or often translated grace in the New Testament. That word can be translated different ways based on context. It can be translated grace or thanks or excellence uh, or even reward. You could use that word here, uh, that you're receiving the reward of God. So he says here, as I mentioned, there's no favor or reward for suffering from doing wrong. However, we experience God's grace, His favor, His blessing when we suffer for doing what is right. All right? So I've done the right thing, I am suffering, I'm being treated unfairly, but yet I am submitting myself to that person who's in authority over me. I'm going to experience God's blessing. God didn't say when, God didn't say how, He said you would. So hang in there, don't quit. The blessing of God, the favor of God, the grace of God is on you as long as you're following God's 
God's command, and God's instruction in His Word to us. So notice what happens in verse 19. It starts with grace. Verse 20, He ends with grace. It starts with favor, and it ends with favor. And that's the bottom line. If I want the blessing of God on my life, then I need to yield myself to that person who's in authority over me. Luke chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus spoke to this. In fact, let me start with verse 31. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. Golden rule, right? Verse 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful just as your Father is also merciful." So Jesus helps us understand what Peter is saying, or Peter's explaining really what Jesus said, and with his own life that we'll see as an example. So why should I submit to my supervisor? Number one, out of respect for God, and it brings God's favor to your life. All right? God's reputation is at stake. The gospel is at stake in the way that I am responding to people in life. Listen, period, any place, any time. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you were tempted to do the wrong thing, say the wrong thing, and you didn't because this person was mistreating you, and later on they came to you and said something like this, hey, I understand you go to Linwood Baptist Church, and, 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 and uh, we, we got a situation in our family, and, and I, I need you to pray with me, pray for me. Aren't you, have you not at that moment said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't say that. I'm so glad I didn't do that. Because God used your response at that situation when you were suffering to bring His favor and blessing, not only for you, but into that person's life. That person's life. So listen, there's no disconnect from what goes on here and what goes on where you work and what goes on in your home. There's no disconnect. We often think, well, I go to church and do the church thing, but old pastor work, it's a different place. No, it's not. It's the same place. It's the exact same place. Because things happen here. And so I need to respond like Jesus would want me to respond to church. Well, guess what? Where you are out there, he expects the same thing of us. I'm dealing with a different crowd. Sometimes you're dealing with that same crowd here. There's no difference. Sometimes how we have the name Christian, but what does that mean? It means a life that's changed, transformed. So that's the attitude that we need to have following our supervisor. So why should I submit out of respect for God? It brings God's favor. I have hope at work when I'm following the leadership of my supervisor. Here's the second point. I'm going to have hope at work when I follow the example of your Savior or my Savior. When you follow the example of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, verse 21 through 25, many believe was a hymn in the early church. One of the earliest hymns that we find. Philippians chapter 2, have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus. That section there was also more than likely an early hymn, a song that was sung in the church. And probably this was too as well. Now verse 21, notice what he says. What was the example? He says, for you were called to this. Okay, I'm called to what? What does to this mean? You're called to suffer. That's part of the deal. To this means that if I'm following Christ, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer for doing what is right. Christ suffered for doing what was right, which he's going to explain. He says you were called to this. God has called us to this suffering. He's ordained it. He's set it up. It's, it's part of it. That if I become a follower of Christ, I'm going to suffer for Christ. In order to receive our inheritance, in order to receive the blessing of God, we're going to suffer. And when we suffer by submitting at work, that is part of God's calling on our lives. It's part of our testing of our faith. Who am I really? And, and that's the venue that God's going to show us how to respond. Now, why is it that we have this calling to suffer? Verse 21, because Christ also suffered for you. He suffered for us. 
we suffer for him. Simple point. Verse 21, leaving you an example. The word example is a great word. The word example was used in, in education in this day and time. A student was given a blank sheet of paper. It was opaque. You could see through it. And then they were given another sheet of paper. If they were learning the letters of the alphabet, they would have this, this bold print letter on this sheet of paper. Then they'd place the opaque over it sheet, and they would trace the, the example that was underneath. They were following the bold print. That was the example that they were to, to follow. Also, it was used of an artist. And so you would have this outline that was there, and it was, that was the example, uh, and he would fill in the details with his giftedness as an artist. So what we find is Jesus is that bold print. I am that opaque sheet of paper that's placed over his life, and I am to trace my life after his life. I'm following the example of Jesus Christ. He suffered. I'm to suffer. And how he responded in his suffering, that's my example. I'm to trace my life in suffering after the suffering of Jesus Christ. All right, so why did Christ leave us an example? Verse 21, so that you would follow in his steps. Our suffering, the way we handle our suffering, will lead others to Christ. Why? Because in his suffering, he led us to God. And as I mentioned earlier, the way in which we suffer leads other people to Christ as well. Chapter 2, verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may be observing your good works they may, by observing your good works, glorify God in the day of visitation. That means at the second coming of Christ. So they're watching us, and they're seeing how we're responding to our suffering. And when we're doing it the right way, it brings glory to God. We're following in His steps. Now, what was the example of Christ that we should follow? Here we find Peter quoting Isaiah 53. Great passage, go back, because it's called the suffering servant, a messianic passage. It's a reference to the Messiah. We know now Jesus Christ and how he would suffer. Now, what was the example that we're to follow? Verse 22, he did not commit sin. Stop right there. When you're suffering at work, when it's not fair, when it's unjust, don't sin. Just don't do the wrong thing. Jesus suffered for doing what was right. He didn't sin. It's just that simple. You're going to be tempted to do the wrong thing. You're going to be tempted to sin in many ways against your employer in the situation that you're in. Here's the command. Just don't sin. He did not commit sin. He was the example. Verse 22, no deceit was found in his mouth. No guile was found in his mouth. So when, when I'm suffering at work, don't say the wrong thing. Don't, don't be deceitful with your words. Oh, you, you say to your boss, hey, you're a great guy. I love you, love you. You're talking to your buddy over here next to you. Man, this guy's a rat. I hate him. I can't stand working for him and all the rest. You're being deceitful. And you're being deceitful as a Christian. You're being somebody different than who you are. Verse 23, he did not revile in return. The word revile there means abusive language. And really it means repeated abusive language. More and more and more and more and more. That's the emphasis of the, of the phrase there. So no abusive language. Verse 23, he did not threaten. Jesus didn't retaliate. Jesus did not get revenge. You know how Jesus got revenge? God raised him from the dead. And you feel dead right now at work. And the way there's going to be revenge is God's going to raise you from the dead. God's going to help you stand again and again and again where you're working in the midst of suffering. And that boss is going to watch you handle this, and he's going to say, there's something different about that guy because all the rest of them don't act like that. But that guy's different. The way he's responding to this suffering that I'm imposing on him at work. Notice verse 23. This is the key to the whole passage. But committed himself, Jesus committed himself to the one God who judges justly. Now, here's the key. God, this isn't fair. I don't like it. I didn't get the promotion. I got the demotion. I didn't get the raise. I got my pay cut. When this guy over here ought to 
you know, he, he, that should happen to him, not me. But I'm going to trust you. I know you're going to work it out in the end. You're, you're the, the, the judge who judges fairly, justly. And I'm going to trust you. Now, what was the purpose of Christ's sufferings? Two things. To give us forgiveness. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Christ died on the cross to take care of our sin problem. He forgave you of every sin you've ever committed. But notice, secondly, to give us power. Verse 24, so that having died to sins, we die to our sins, we might live for righteousness. So how do we live a godly life while suffering? We die to our sins. And in that, we're living a righteous life. That's how we live a righteous life. Our sins are forgiven, and listen, we have a new kind of life. You know, a lot of people believe that when they become a Christian, it's just about having their sin forgiven so they can go to heaven and not hell. And Peter makes it very clear, and, and most of the New Testament writers make it clear, no, no, no. It's much more than that. In fact, you don't understand salvation if that's all you understand. Salvation is about a new life in Christ, a different kind of life, and that applies where you work. And he's going to show other examples later on in this chapter. So now Peter affirms the healing power of Christ in this example. Verse 24, the latter part. By his wounding, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. He's primarily talking about healing due to our sins. If you just read the context of the passage before and after here, he's primarily talking about that our sins have been healed by the wounds of Christ. Again, the word wound is referring back to slavery. The slaves were beaten, they were wounded, they were lashed. Jesus was as well beaten. So there would be that tie there, but for a different reason. The sinless Son of God, He did not commit sin. The sinless Son of God was beaten, He was wounded for our spiritual healing. Now it doesn't mean that God does not heal. God obviously heals, and there are other passages in the Scriptures that talk about that. But this is the primary point of the context. So Christ suffered for us, giving us salvation and a new life. And our response to suffering has the opportunity to lead others to faith in Christ. Now notice, we are not submitting to our employer, but to our ultimate authority, the shepherd and the guardian of our souls, the one who is leading us, who's leading our lives. So how do we have hope at work? Number one, follow the leadership of your supervisor. Secondly, Follow the example of your Savior. Now, I want to stop right now, and I want to make this very, very uh, personal uh, because, you know, God just really spoke to me about this, and I need to say this word to our church family. And guest, just bear with me for a moment. And it's all about following the example of Christ. And wherever we are, we're to be an example to others. At work, we're an example here at church. We're an example at school. We'll have, we have some of our college students are starting to come back. It's good to see you guys. And uh, we'll have more next week uh, as SEMO starts. But uh, I'm going to talk to our kids about this as well. At school, you know, when we suffer, uh, maybe a teacher who's in authority over us. I, I, I remember one time my principal called me down to his office, and I was in junior high, and he said, all right, Anderson, you want three hot shots or three days of tension? That was with a paddle. You know, they spanked us back then. And I said, that's, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but that's what they did. And, and, and I, I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, Tim, Timothy, I forgot his last name, said that you uh, stole his bike after school. I said, what are you talking about? I was at football practice. Go call the coach. I was out there on the field. Well, and, and sure enough, he called the coach. I was out on the field, and this guy said that. And I thought, man, you know, there's an example. Well, how do you submit to authority in that? The example of Christ. This week, I, I took uh, Will and Andrea uh, to, to Liberty University, Andrea being our youngest. So she's the last one, all right? And uh, so that's been four now. Uh, all of them now have uh, gone to school, and, and we, we've had 18 years with her at home, the last one. And uh, it was tough saying goodbye, obviously, and uh, long ride home. Somebody asked me, he said, well, did Karen shed tears? I said, Karen, what about me? I mean, man, I was a train wreck, still am. And, and, and so we said goodbye, got back home. But, you know, I told Karen on the way home, I, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm sad in a way, but the tears really are about being blessed. Oh, I, I'm just so thankful 
for the grace of God, the favor of God on our family. And I can only say it's because of the grace of God. When I look at our kids and I just see that they have a passion for Christ and what God has done, and God reminded me of this as I was reviewing my notes for this, for this sermon today, that I want to say thank you to the church family for your example to them. As you submitted to Christ, as you followed the steps of Christ, as you were an example to Him, that affirmed what I'm trying to teach my kids at home. They were a part of this church for many years. Many of you taught them. You rocked them when they were babies. You sang, Jesus loved me to them. You taught them the Bible. You made them memorize scriptures. They'd come home and tell us, we had to memorize this scripture. We'd get a pen or whatever it was. And they were in the Awana program, and they, uh, they, they did different things that many of you invested in our children's lives. And many of our children have watched you suffer. And they've seen your example. And I want to say thank you for helping us and helping our kids see what it means to follow Christ in every venue of life. And that's what this is about. You know, following the example of Christ is, yeah, sometimes you may be the only person in their life that's, that's leading them to faith in Christ and showing them what it means to be a follower of Christ. But I'm telling you, it's such a blessing to be part of a church where that's affirmed in so many different ways. They hear it, but they see it in your lives. And I want to commend you, and I want to ask you to just continue to follow Christ when it gets tough and you want to say the wrong thing, you want to do the wrong thing. And my kids have said, you know, I saw that. And Dad, this is what they said. This is what they did. Man, it was just a great affirmation of what God was doing in your life at that time when you could have gone the other way, but you didn't. And you were an example of Christ to them. And, 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 and really, that's the bottom line of our faith is helping leadies, leading others to Christ by following the steps of Jesus Christ. And so I, I just want to say thank you as the pastor, because, you know, listen, do you have any idea how many kids are on staff at this church and, how, and the opportunity you're going to have in the next 15, 20 years to influence them for Jesus Christ? You know, because uh, they live in a, in a, in a, in a fishbowl, you know, the, 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 and, and we know that and we embrace that. Uh, and uh, sometimes that can be challenging. But, but, you have a staff who are led by godly men and, 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 and godly women, but they need your help. They need your support. They need your example in Christ. There might be somebody here this morning who would say, Pastor, it's my desire to follow the example of Jesus Christ because I need His help in handling the challenges of my life, the suffering that I'm facing because I can't do it alone. I've tried to do it alone and it's not working. And, and, and if Christ is able to forgive me of my sin and also give me the power to live a godly life, I, I, I need that. And I want that. Because I need that help. And I really want to begin a journey of faith where I can know God and know His power in my life. Listen, it works. It works. I, I, it just works. If you follow Christ. He's going to help you. And even when things are tough, and even when it doesn't turn out like you thought it was going to turn out, it's going to be all right because God's going to be faithful to you. And I want to get, offer you the invitation of Jesus Christ. He said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And he wants to do that this morning in your life. There are others, you're struggling, you're a follower of Christ, but there's little hope. And maybe where you're working today, I pray, God, help me to submit to that person in authority over me in a way that will bring glory to you. I just don't do it because of his favor. That's a, that's a blessing. That's a benefit. But the ultimate is, God, your reputation is at stake in the way I handle this, and I don't want to blow it. So give me the wisdom and the, and the ability to do the right thing. He'll do that for you. You ask him, he'll show you how to do that. You might need to talk to somebody who, who can help you do that. There's some that God is leading to become part of our church family. And we would love to have you here at Linwood. Not a perfect church, but it's a great church with great people who love Christ and want to help you in following Christ. They, they want to be an example to you.
And so I invite you to come today. Others, you just may to come and talk with somebody, pray with someone. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you that you have given us hope in every venue of life, where we work, where we live, where we, where we come and worship. And it's all because of Christ and the example that he set before us. Help us to follow that example even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you quietly stand?